Hey everyone, how are you? Hello, hello. Uh, my name is Julie Faye Van Balzer, and I can see in the chat that we've got people from Brazil, Colorado, Oregon, Northern California, lots of different places. So thanks for all of your comments. I always appreciate that. And I like to know what you're thinking. Uh, and someone who's on their lunch break from Virginia. Okay, so we are discussing today collage techniques by Gerald Brommer. It may be Brommer, it might be Bromer. I've never heard it pronounced. So if you know, please let me know. Um, I did find a video of him. It turns out that he passed away a couple of years ago. This book is actually from 94. It's almost 20 years old. Um, so uh, there are a few like DVD type things of his around, which is always interesting to see. So um, today I thought we would just sort of talk through the book. I have to tell you, um, true confession time. So this book has been sitting on my bookshelf for a couple years. I bought it years ago based on a recommendation that I can't even remember who it was from. And it came and I was like, I don't know, like the picture, like the work inside is not that exciting to me. It's really dense, like it is really dense and academic. And I just kind of put it to the side and didn't think about it. But I took the opportunity of book club to go ahead and really read every single word and look at every single caption. And oh my God, it's a, such a fantastic book. So if you've read it, I really hope you'll share what you like about it. But I am definitely gonna share what I like about it because I like a lot. I feel like I learned a lot. I feel like I got a huge creative injection from it. I made a ton of art in my sketchbook, which was really fantastic. Um, but first, let's start. I'm going to turn on the second camera and I'm using a bit of a new setup. So do let me know if there's feedback or anything like that that's happening because I want to make sure that there isn't. But you should be able to see my hand cam as I'm calling it here uh, where that's nice and big for you. And let's see, my hand cam should be the big one. There you go. Uh, okay, so um, a couple notes about how, sort of how I deal with books. So I own this book, so I'm able to write directly in it, which is really nice. So you can see that I did some highlighting with a highlighter. And so the question people often say like is, what are you highlighting? Why are you highlighting certain things? And so my personal goal when I'm going through a book like this and highlighting things is I wanna be able to read the book without reading the book. And what I mean by that is I wanna be able to just, if I come to this page and I see this, I wanna have anything that's important for me to read a second time is only in the highlighted area. So. For instance, successful collages employ the elements of design that are essential to their work, line, shape, color, value, texture, and space, uh, balance, contrast, emphasis, movement, proportion, pattern, variety, and most important, unity. Collage artists are superb designers of space and working with easily adjustable materials and collage services surely strengthens their compositional sensitivities. That's it. Even though there's all this other text on the page, the only thing I want to be able to come back and read is this kind of stuff. You'll also notice that I write in my book. Yep. These big, beautiful margins. I think I have a place, hold on, where I even drew. Yeah. So here you go. Here's a place where I actually drew in the margin a little bit. And the reason for that is there were these several things, these terms, and I didn't know them. So I knew what a cruciform was, but I didn't know what contour continuation and bridging were as design things. So I went ahead and I did some Googling and I researched what they were because they weren't explained in the book. And then I drew some sketches to explain them to myself. And I'll just explain them to you in case you don't know. So these are apparently three common designs that a lot of collage artists use. So a cruciform is pretty easy to understand. It's a cross shape, okay? Contour continuation was an interesting one to me. So you can see I've drawn a little red teacup here. And the idea of contour continuation is that you continue the lines of the object to the edges of the canvas or the page or whatever it is you're doing. And you wouldn't obviously have the object be so separate like I have it here. It's almost like cubism. If you look at cubism, it's like taking a skewed perspective of how to continue your work. So that's an interesting idea. And then bridging is this idea where you have disparate elements here, disparate elements here, and then you literally create a bridge to connect them. So I thought those were three interesting visual um, short short uh, cut formats that you know Gerald Brommer was suggesting. So that's why I wanted to go ahead and draw that. Um, then you'll notice I have a bunch of these yellow stickies hanging out of my book. And again, like I've done library books where you can't do this, and then I have to take paper notes. But the thing that's nice about um, owning the book is obviously you can do all that writing. So 
every place there's a sticky was something that was kind of like an exercise that I could do. So this is the first exercise in the book that I wanted to do. And he sort of takes you through this process where what you do is you create, um, you, you just create sort of a large watercolor area, then you put washi paper over it, then you add more watercolor, then you add more marks, and then you get something like this. And if I'm being completely honest, this was not exciting to me. This was not making me go like, oh yeah, I totally want to make that. But you know what I've learned over the years of both teaching and being a student is that sometimes just because I don't like the finished product doesn't mean that I don't like the, the process. So I went ahead in my sketchbook and I experimented with this process. And you can see I wrote myself a lot of notes about what I did, which I think is important. Now, my piece doesn't look like his piece. And I think that's important to remember. We're all different artists. But basically, I just experimented with his ideas of taking watercolor, putting wa I didn't have any washi paper. So I used some rice paper that I had, which is very similar. Um, and then adding more watercolor. And I was very, I had a lot of fun. Do I think this is a great masterpiece? No, but it's in my sketchbook. And I feel like I learned a lot from doing it, which was really great. I also will say this, which is I've had this rice paper kicking around in my collection for a while. And I did his next technique. Where is it? Hmm, it's not, oh, here. Stained papers. And what you do is you take this white washi paper and you stain it with watercolor and it really turns out just so beautiful. I hope you can see all the beautiful just color variation in that. It's really lovely. Um, and I really enjoy doing that. Um, and again, you know, it's just watercolor and this rice paper and it gets these really soft looks. Now, one quick tip for you is when I did this, um, I did it on top of a piece of silicone release paper. And what that did is it meant that the paper, the colors just pooled really nicely as opposed to if you did it on top of an absorbent surface, but you can see the beautiful brush strokes and all the little details in here. They're just, they're really pretty paper. So I enjoy doing this stained paper process. I don't usually use this kind of paper because it's so thin and it rips so easily. And I usually prefer my deli paper, which doesn't take watercolor. So this was a fun alternative. And I made myself a palette of color. And based on that, I did try his next exercise in here, which is building an abstracted landscape. So I learned a lot. It sounds silly, but I learned a lot. These are the examples that he has of his abstracted landscapes. And I was like, that doesn't look hard. I can rip, you know, pieces of paper and glue them down. Well, mine looks atrocious. <laughs> but that's, again, this goes back to like, what's the point of a sketchbook, right? So... Um, here is mine and it looks like doo-doo and I learned a bunch of different things, which I should have known. One of which is I don't have enough value differences in here. I've got a little bit of dark and then everything's kind of the same. And then the second thing that I learned is if you look, if you look at his, there are a couple ways in which they're different. And this is why I think it's so useful. Um, books are so great because you really can look back and, and see, but he's really playing with proportion in a better way than I am, right? A large empty space and smaller strips, you know, um, and also the edges are very clean. They've been cut essentially, or they've been made on smaller pieces of paper. My edges are extremely messy and I have not done a good job with proportions at all. So I even drew myself a little picture here where I was like, hello proportions need to be better. And I put values down for myself, but then I made myself a little um, viewfinder and I fixed it. So now I really like my landscape because it's this tiny little landscape. The proportions are better, right? Because now I have this big brown area at the bottom instead of sort of generalized. You really see the green, which really got lost before. And again, those beautiful stained papers are really taking center stage and they think they look so good. So this was a really good lesson for me and a reminder to everyone. Um, I'm gonna make my face big when I say this because I wanna yell it at you really big. Just a huge reminder that failure is not fatal. In fact, you want to fail. You learn a lot from failure. Learning is failure or failure is learning or there's something in there that I think is so important, which is the struggle 
to get it right, the times when it isn't right, and then the ways that you discover to fix it, that's the key to being successful in the future. Truly, 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 that is the, the way that you will become better at whatever it is you're interested in doing is if you continue to just fail and then do the learning. And I think some people miss the learning phase of it, which is they just get frustrated with the failure. And so they walk away and say, oh, I'm a failure. I can't do this. I don't want to do it. It's not fun. And I'm here to be your cheerleader. And I'm here to say to you that failure is good. But you have to do the work of failure, which is you have to think of like, what is it that you can do to change it? And I love this thing that Jillian just said, which is she says there's no shame in failure, only in the neglect to try. And that is 100 percent true. 100 percent true. I think it's so important to try. So thank you, Lillian. I think that's a great comment. Um, OK, so I have failed <laughs> and I have learned. And that is one of the things that I'm really um, emphasizing in my sketchbook here. Let's see if I can make this bigger again, is that I write myself copious notes in my sketchbook about everything, copious notes about everything. Most of my sketchbook is honestly a ton of writing because it's so important. You won't remember when you come back to this, the things you want to take away. It's kind of a little bit like highlighting the book. I want to be able to come back to that page and not have to think a lot. I want to be able to come back to the page and just be like, oh, these are the notes that I wrote instead of having to read every single thing. And in fact, you'll notice on this page, for instance, about the abstracted landscapes, you know, I highlighted one single thing and it wasn't the instructions on how to do the landscape. I highlighted when building an abstracted landscape, a design focus will help guide the direction of your work. And I thought that was great because I didn't have a design focus when I did this. I was just gluing strips of paper. And I and so what I want to remember is to think about it a little bit more. So I think that's really important, too. Um, and so Evelyn says, love what you just said, trying to get myself and my kid to understand this. Oh, my gosh. I have a little one who's only 18 months, and so I don't think he fails all the time and he's used to it, so I don't think it's a big deal, but I can see that when he gets older, that's going to be something that I really want to model, model as much as possible, so more power to you, Evelyn. I hope that it works out. Um, and then, Jana, thank you so much. I appreciate the donation. That's always nice. And Ellen says, um, so true about failure. That's one of the main things we're learning in boot camp. It's really important when stretching yourself. So in case you don't know, I run a design boot camp along with a lot of other classes. And so we're in the final home stretch of boot camp. And we've been talking a lot about being OK with failure as you learn. It's important. It's a good thing. OK. OK. So. I am going to go ahead and go on to the next thing in the book that at least caught my eye. If you guys have read this book and you have things that have caught your eye, please yell out because I think we're all different, you know, and we all have different things that interest us and we can learn a lot from what's interesting to other people. So this is the technique that blew my mind. This is not hyperbole. This page blew my mind. Okay. So let's just talk about something really quickly before I explain this to you. So the normal collage process, I think we're probably all used to, right? What you do is you take a piece of paper and you take some other things and you kind of, you know, move them around and make some adjustments and kind of trying to figure out what's right. And once you find a configuration that you like, you take whatever your adhesive of choice is and you try to like glue it down without moving anything, right? And we're all we're all kind of used to that process. That's a totally normal uh, process. So this blows my mind because this is not how this works. So with this process, which is called using prepared papers and a unique collage technique, you take all of your papers and you can see that this paper is shiny. Both sides have been coated with gloss matte medium with gloss matte medium. Now I just call it matte medium. It's not gloss matte medium. It's gloss medium. Let's try that again. Both of the, <laughs> this, both sides of this have been coated with gloss medium as opposed to matte medium. So something I tell people constantly and all the time, which take this tip, if you take nothing else from this, if your art journal pages stick together, it's because you have too many shiny paints in your art journal. You need to use matte products, matte glues, matte paints, all those kinds of things because, because gloss makes things stick. And so guess what? 
this is the genius of this technique. So basically what I did is I coded all of my paper. So a book page, this is, um, these are deli paper, painted deli paper coated with the gloss medium, two coats on each side. And you can see that the deli paper obviously goes completely translucent where there's no paint, which is super cool. So if you lay it on top of something else, you get the something else showing through. Um, this is a piece of copy paper that I had done some gelatin printing on, I think, or some stenciling, which you can see right there. Another book page, more sort of yellowed. And then this is a piece of rice paper, which I scribbled on with a stencil. It was completely white. It was like, it's the same paper that I used for this. It was completely white and I scribbled on it with a pencil. And when I put the gloss medium on both sides, it went this interesting translucent kind of thing. So here's what makes this so cool. Here is the collage that I made using this technique. So you can see the base is a piece of watercolor paper. Here is that um, rice paper, the book pages, some of the deli paper, but here is what is magical about it. So you take whatever your substrate is, let's say my substrate's gonna be, I actually use watercolor paper, which I coated with the gloss medium. Then you take whatever your next layer is and you put it on. And it, it, you know, it might stick a little bit, not really. And then you kind of put your next layer on and you can obviously cut or rip, or I mean, it's still paper, even though it has the gloss medium on it. And you kind of arrange things however you want them to be, okay? And let's say this is my brilliant final collage. All I need to do is place some silicone paper on each side and iron it. I don't have to lift anything up and it is permanently adhered, permanently adhered. So that's it, I just iron it and boom, it's permanently adhered, which is what I did here. So there's no glue in this, I just ironed it and it is good to go. Now, if you don't like the shine, you could certainly put a layer of matte medium or something on top of it. But I have to tell you, a lot of people do go ahead and um, varnish their finished collages to make them look finished. So your, your step is kind of done here. So this one blew my mind. You do not need to move anything, pick it up. You just iron it and you're done. I thought that was really cool. So even though it's a little bit of a pain to prep all the papers because you have to do all that work, it's less of a pain once you start assembling your collage. So how cool is that? I thought it was one of the super coolest things I've ever seen. Okay, so let's get back into the book. Yeah, actually, this is a good point that Jana makes here too, where she says it looks like wax, because I actually think it has that encaustic feeling without having to actually drag out the encaustic wax, which is kind of neat, because as long as you're, especially if you're layering up a lot of these kind of translucent layers, you could get lots of cool waxy looking layers going on here that I think would be really, really neat. So this is a technique I'm gonna experiment a lot more with. I really, really liked it. Okay. Um, so Ruth says, oh, I, so for source of all, Janine says, finally used for the iron I no longer need, yes. Um, and uh, what paper did you iron? So you, you have to cover this with something like a silicone paper, which is what I did, but that's all you do and you just iron the whole thing any of the papers that are treated, which is really easy and awesome. And again, the book has all the instructions here, so I did not make this up. This is all from this book, from this page. Okay, so a couple of quick things just before we move on to the next bit, which is I just want to, if you're not already a monthly member, I hope you'll consider joining. Membership is super fun and you have get live events like this one and all sorts of cool stuff. So it starts at $5.99 a month. And you can check that all out at uh, bit.ly backslash Balzer membership. Um, and of course, if you want to sign up for my free Friday newsletter, you can do that and you can get updated always when there are new events and new fun things. I hope you'll check that out too. Okay, let's get back into it. So the next thing that was interesting to me personally was manipulating photographs. I thought this was super duper interesting. So basically, 
what he's suggesting is you can splice together photographs in really simple ways to basically create new images. And you can kind of tell stories as you do them, right? This is two different women combined into one woman. So I thought that was kind of a fun and interesting way to look at doing it. Um, so I wanted to experiment with some of those and see what I could do. Uh, okay, so before I do that, though, let me just answer a couple questions because I don't want to get too far away from this technique before I do that. So for Gay's question, could you just coat one side to keep the matte finish? No. The whole reason that it adheres together is because of the gloss. So you'd need to put a matte finish on the top. Um, and Janice says you can always buy a little travel iron. And actually, they do suggest a tacking iron is the iron that they suggest. Um, and silicone paper you can find online. And in fact, I probably have a link for you. Hold on a second. I'll just grab that if I can right here. I buy mine from Amazon. I, it's just called um, silicone release paper. I actually put it in my heat press, I have to confess, because it was easy and I knew it was going to do heat and pressure. But here is a link to silicone release paper. There you go. I just posted that in the chat. Um, and parchment paper, I wouldn't use. You want to really, Lori asks that question. You want to really use something like Teflon. I mean, it's a lot of heat. Here's what I'd say. If you're not afraid of ruining your iron or the collage, then you can try all sorts of things. Otherwise, go with something you know is going to work. And that's true of so many things. If you're not afraid of ruining it, experiment, experiment, you know? Um, so since it's gloss, it will stick in your journal. Yes. Yes. It will stick your pages together. Yes. Uh, Jana says that she's a member and she highly recommends. I think that's great. Thank you so much. So the book that we're suggesting, I believe is in the description here. If you came in late or if you miss it, but I will say it again, which is it's collage techniques by Gerald Brommer. And again, the link to the book is in the video description for you. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think that's all the questions. Would a Teflon sheet work? Delancey says, and yes, Teflon sheet would work great too for releasing. Okay. So let's go on to the photos. So the first one that I experimented with, you can see right here, is I took two photos, which I think there were a couple of problems with the photos that I chose, which again is learning, which is important. You should always be learning from whatever happens. And I spliced both photos together and they were photos that I had taken and they had some similarities. They were photos I had taken when I was in Sydney, Australia. Both photos had water. They both had foliage and reflection and I thought they might make an interesting pairing. Come on camera. Um, but they ended up just being really kind of dark and murky and not particularly interesting. So that was really disappointing. Um, I'm gonna have to hide this camera, hold on and let's see if I can't get it to refocus. Um, I love it when the webcam doesn't focus. Here you go. Maybe let's see if we can get it to cooperate. Uh, let me see one more time if I can get it to cooperate. And let's try that. Let's try that. Oh, looks great. Okay. Much better. Okay, so um, I learned a couple things, which is I think they need to have better, clearer pictures. And I also noticed when I look back at this, not only is this a very clear photo, but the colors um, and the value differences in each photo are very striking so that you can really still see the image and it's a close up of her face as opposed to sort of a messy landscape. So I wanna try it again with something else, you know, that might work, okay? Um, so kind of a miss, but again, I think there's always learning here. Um, this is the next photo piece that I tried. And this is kind of based on, I have a class on doing an expanded square or the note tan theory. And so this is kind of taking a, um, taking like a little page out of that book, I guess is what I would say. It's the idea that again, you flip things out. So you can see they did some very, simple circles and squares here. And then I tried it. I wanted it to communicate a story. I didn't just want it to be like, the question is why are you cutting things out of the photo? 
And I think this is something that I've been thinking about a lot. So I'm just going to, um, if I may preach at you for one more minute here. One of the things that's so important is to really think about why are you doing this kind of art? Why are you cutting up this photo? Is it, and you know, if it's just because it's fun, that's great. But if you're really thinking about it as like art with a capital A, which you don't have to, but you might be interested in, then I think you want to think a lot about why you're doing things. And so I thought, well, I can tell a story about the blue half being the sky and the green half being the ground by really emphasizing the cutout shapes from those two parts being about that, meaning I'm cutting like a cloud shape out of the sky, I'm cutting kind of a tree shape out of the trees. And it's almost like a joke or a play on what's actually happening in the photo here. So that's kind of the idea behind why I chose these particular ways to do this. Now, this isn't exactly a traditional no tan because it um, you can't flip the photo over, right, in order to do that. So instead, it's kind of like no tan-ish, expanded square-ish, which I think is fine too. You know, it's all about making it work. So I will um, post a quick link if anybody's interested to the class that I have on no tan or expanded square um, right in the chat, just so that anybody who's interested can check that out. It's a great technique and you really learn a lot about positive and negative space. And again, I have all my notes about what I should do differently next time, which is always a good idea. Okay, so then I think this is the last exercise that I did in the book. Yeah, I love this one. This is one that I think I'm going to take with me for a long time. So this is still lives. And if you're like me, you probably think of still lives as being like, you know, pretty traditional things that painters do. But this is still life collage. And some of them are very, still fairly realistic, right? You can see the items in it, fairly realistic. And then there are things that are hyper non-realistic, right? So I wanted to try my hand at doing a, um, oh, I'll get to these in a minute. These are also an exercise from the book. Um, so here I have a big spread here where I experimented with this in my sketchbook. I have a photo that I found online and it's of some fruit in a bowl. And then I did a little bit of playing with it in collage. And then I wanted to pull it out so that it was, you know, sort of even less realistic. So again, photo, collage, sort of less realistic representation of it. And I wanted to keep going with it. So could I bring in some of the stuff that I like. Does the orange need to be an orange or could it just be a square of color? You know, I, what I really liked was this angle, which you can see I'm sort of playing with over and over. Could I, you know, add in some things that weren't collage, dots and lines, and like, how did that change it? And I even have a to-do for myself in the corner, which is I need more single color painted collage paper because I have a lot of stuff like you know, that has lots of pattern and all sorts of stuff, but not a lot of stuff like this piece or this piece where they're just like single color. So that's something I want to add into my collage stash. But you can see like this is sort of my thought process after going through some of the stuff here. And he has some really great questions that he asks here. Um, will adding texture animate the surface? How can I define the focal point of the work? Will the composition benefit from the addition of lines or pattern papers? Are the shapes linked together in interesting ways? Do the locations of the various elements stimu stimulate interest? Is the foreground dynamic? Does the foreground lead the eye into the collage? Are the shapes, values, and colors visually balanced? Would white paper provide an exciting contrast? So you can see I drew a big rectangle around here because I want to be able to come back and visit this idea um, and this list of questions many different times. And when I'm, you know, looking through here, I want to be able to find that. And by the way, do you remember how I talked about contour continuation at the beginning? This is an example of contour continuation. It's one of the reasons I highlighted it. Can you see how he like continues the vase down, sort of continues, you know, some lines that come from the table through, continue some of, so that, that's the idea of contour continuation. It's kind of an interesting idea that I had never heard of, and I'm interested in pursuing that a lot. Do I use the word interesting too much? Okay, so um, 
thanks. Uh, for, is I hope what's pronounced Delia. Delia. Um, amazing. Your sketches and interpretation of each one. Yeah. Sketchbooks are such a great thing in order to keep track of what you're doing, where you're going, all your ideas in one place. Cause you know, my brain would fall out if it wasn't just locked inside my head. And I see that Holly says that she does a lot of collage and does on book pages in building her journals. And I think it's great. However you want to do it. Okay. So the last thing that I think I pursued in here is this little tab that I missed. Um, which is really just from a note here in the, it, it, this is a photo caption and it says stained washi in a limited palette, two colors plus black and white. And talking about building this collage just from using two colors plus black and white. So I thought I want to try that. So what I did is I made four little thumbnail sketches using two colors. This is um, yellow oxide and phthalo green and black and white. And I wanted to see what I could do with making some little mixed media collages. And I think this would be a really interesting project to do to see how much you can do with that really severely limited palette, you know, very cool. Um, and I appreciate so much what Glenda says here, where she says, you have made me think differently about the books that I have on my shelf. Thanks, Glenda. I appreciate that. You know, I think so often we think of books as things that um, maybe have an exercise you might want to do or that are like pretty to look through or something like that. But what I really think is the usefulness of these is this is a class. This is a course of study. And if you're disciplined enough, not just to read it and think about it, it's kind of like, do you watch the YouTube videos, but then not do any projects? Do you flip through Instagram, but then not actually do anything? You know, I think sometimes, and trust me when I say, sitting on my bookshelf for years and I was so resistant to it, but if you actually sit down and have the discipline to take out your sketchbook and how many pages did I fill in here? One, two three, four, five, six, seven. So I filled eight pages in my sketchbook just from thinking about exercises in this book. And I could probably do more if I dove a little deeper. And so I think like that's a great way to use your books. This is a workbook. And that's why I say like this book isn't precious. Write in it, draw in it, like use it. I've heard a lot of people say they take books like this and they go to like Kinko's or Staples or something like that. And they have them cut off here and put in a spiral binding so it lays flat on the desk. And I think that's a really great idea too for really thinking about, you know, what you could do. So, um, so Janine says, are those two color cut pieces from your stash or did you make them just for the exercise? I made them just for the exercise. Um, because they needed it to be just those two colors, I took two pieces of paper I think one was a washi paper and one was a deli paper and I cut, I covered them with um, paint and then I just made the little collages and I sat down and I did all four at the same time. So that can make sort of different decisions. I think it's really important, um, you know, to work them through. And then Janine follows up by saying, I have so many instructional books I've bought and I thumb through them, but I need to sit down and do the exercises. Yes. It makes a huge difference to actually do the exercises. I'm totally guilty of thumbing through them and not doing it, but like I paid for these books and I need to use them and they are classes and it's a great, you know, thing to do. So yeah, really, really helpful. Okay. So, um, I hope is that, you know, some of you might be interested in coming back for next month's book club. Uh, so I just want to mention really quickly that next month's book club is going to be all about this book printing by hand. And if you are interested in being an on-camera book club guest, meaning you have read the book and you're interested in discussing it with people and sharing from it, um, I'd love to have you. So uh, you can see I have the, it's going to be July 7th at 1215. It streams live to Facebook and YouTube, the technical requirements, or you have to have a good internet connection. Um, you have to have a camera and a mic in your computer that you know how to operate and you have to be in a well-lit room of some kind to broadcast from. And you need to prepare two to three takeaways from the book, you know, so just some things that you took away that you thought were interesting and a project you made based on the information in the book. And then if you're interested, just send me an email with all that information and I would love to have you be on camera because like a real book club, as much as the chat is fun, I'd love to have some people on camera chatting 
and doing all that stuff. And, you know, we can have up to eight people <laughs> at the same time, which I think would be really fun. So if anybody's interested, feel free to email me and let me know. Okay. Um, so I see a couple last questions, which I do want to answer. So if you have any questions, be sure to get them in so that I can answer all of them for you. So Lori says, does my sketchbook, if I decide to do one, have to be a watercolor paper? No, my sketchbook is not watercolor paper. I love these Strathmore mixed media books. I have a bunch of these. This is what I use for a sketchbook most often. I think they're great and they're easy and no. There, and also, if anybody tells you it has to be a watercolor paper, unless you're a watercolor artist, I don't know why that would be true. Um, Ellen, oh, Ellen's read the book. Yay. And she says, I enjoyed the chapter on emphasis on design, especially relevant for those in boot camp. 100%. I think that's true too. Um, so just a couple things. You can take an art class from me at balzerdesigns.com. I would love to connect with you on Instagram. I'm Balzer Designs there and everywhere else. Um, don't forget to sign up for my Friday newsletter, which basically it's an email you get in your inbox every Friday. It's totally free. It has a little bit of inspiration and then all the updates and all the stuff that's going on. You can become a monthly member for $5.99 a month. I appreciate it. I am the breadwinner for my house, so it makes a big difference to all of us. And the next book club is on July 7th at 12.15, and we'll be discussing, as I said, Printing My Hand by Lena Corwin. So uh, I want to say thank you so much to all of you for being here. It makes a huge difference also for having you guys make comments. That makes this so much more lively and interesting and fun for everyone. I know that. So thank you. Thank you for taking the time. Time is the most valuable resource that any of us have. So I know that when you choose to spend some time with me, it means a lot. So thank you so much. And I will hopefully, hopefully see you next month. Okay, signing off. Talk to you later. Bye.